Welcome everyone to Narratives of Enslaved Virginians. I'm Sheila Budoff with Arlington County's 55 Plus program, and I'm delighted to welcome you today. This program is being recorded and will be posted on Arlington County's 55 Plus YouTube channel when time permits. Our speakers will be spotlighted so that only they appear in the recording. You're viewing this program through the Virtual Center for Active Adults platform, VCAA, a partnership of Northern Virginia jurisdictions to provide free virtual programming for older adults and adults with disabilities. Many thanks to Jenny Thompson at VCAA, uh, and thanks to Charlika Ashton, supervisor of Arlington's 55 plus virtual programming. And also a very special thanks to Bridget Wisdom, adult services librarian for Arlington Public Library uh, for partnering with the 55 plus program on this program. Um, it's always a pleasure to partner with Bridget. She's amazing, a wonderful resource, very knowledgeable and a delight in every way. Okay, so to narratives of enslaved Virginians. I first learned about this topic from an article I read in the Washington Post written by David A. Taylor. I found it intriguing that as part of the Writers Project, a, a WPA Works Progress Administration initiative of the New Deal, that historians were being sent to the South uh, in the 1930s uh, to interview formerly enslaved people who had been born into slavery and later freed. Uh, I, and the purpose of the program was to preserve their stories for history. I found this so intriguing, I reached out to David Taylor, the author of the article, and he very kindly agreed, uh, much to my <laughs> surprise, uh, to speak with us. I also reached out to the Library of Congress, which is where the voices of these enslaved African Americans are documented, and was very lucky to reach Dr. Sybil Moses and Angela McMillan, who also kindly agreed to speak with us. I'm going to quickly introduce our speakers. Their biographies are very, very lengthy. They're very distinguished. And I apologize for abbreviating the bios in advance, but it would take almost all of our program, I think, uh, for these very distinguished people. Um, David Taylor is an author and filmmaker on topics related to history and science. He's written several books, including Soul of a People, the WPA Writers Project Uncovers Depression America, which was named Amazon's best book of the month and one of the best books of 2009. His work has been published in Smithsonian Magazine, The Washington Post, The Village Voice, Outside, The Christian Science Monitor, Science, and Oxford American. He teaches science writing at Johns Hopkins University, gives Writer Center workshops, and is a guest author with the Penn Faulkner Writers in Schools program. He's won numerous awards for his writing, far too numerous to mention here, unfortunately. Dr. Sybil E. Moses is a reference specialist in the Library of Congress's Humanities and Social Sciences Division. She holds a master's degree in library and information science and a PhD from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She also holds a master's in public administration. Dr. Moses has had a very distinguished career as a librarian, archivist, associate executive, association executive, sorry, and library educator in the US and abroad. She has written many scholarly articles published in American, British, and Nigerian professional journals. Her publications have received numerous awards, including her monograph, African American Women Writers in New Jersey, 1836 to 2000, which was named a New Jersey Notable Book for 1995 to 2005, recognized by the American Association for State and Local History, and selected by Ebony Magazine as one of the top picks for women in the nonfiction category. Our third speaker, Angela McMillan, 
has a BA in history from the University of the District of Columbia and a master's in library and information science from Catholic University of America. Her career at the Library of Congress began in 1993 and she has been a reference librarian at the library since 2001. She currently works in the researcher and reference services division in the main reading room. I'm gonna turn the program over uh, to David Taylor, Dr. Moses and Angela McMillan. Uh, I would ask, we're gonna hold questions until the end. You're more than welcome to enter them in the chat, but uh, we'll address them at the end. So without further ado, I'm turning it over to our wonderful speakers. Thank you so much, Sheila. Um, uh, I'll start, um, uh, thank you, Sheila and Bridget, and thanks to the Arlington County team. Uh, I'm David Taylor and a, a writer who has studied the Federal Writers Project and its legacy uh, for the book that uh, Sheila mentioned called Soul of a People. Um, and recently for a podcast called The People's Recorder, which is in process with uh, Spark Media uh, with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And uh, I'm excited today to join uh, Dr. Sybil Moses and Angela McMillan from the Library of Congress. Uh, and uh, of course, I have, as a, in my research, have, have really benefited from uh, the holdings at the library, uh, so many resources on the topic of narratives of uh, formerly enslaved uh, Americans broadly and, and uh, those in Virginia. Um, and uh, so we'll aim to present uh, resources that document the lives of people who were enslaved and who provided accounts of their lives later. Um, as we'll hear, um, those resources include both digital and uh, non-digitized items at the library, uh, not just in those uh, narratives collected in the 1930s that I'll be focusing on, but uh, a much wider range of, uh, of materials that uh, my colleagues will, will talk about. And we in this area, I, I really uh, want a special note for librarians, both in Arlington and uh, at the library. Uh, uh, the reference librarians at the Library of Congress are just a fantastic help. Uh, if you're uh, have a basically have a driver's license, um, you know, you can go and uh, get a, a researcher card and visit the library in person and, and do research in the main reading room. And it's a it's a remarkable experience. Um, so I uh, my path to learning about those voices of formerly enslaved uh, Virginians and, and others involved the research there and also a trip south uh, to Hampton, Virginia, uh, that I mentioned in the article um, last summer for what the Washington Post that, that Sheila mentioned. Uh, I was there in Hampton where the uh, largest effort to record uh, interviews with Virginian survivors of slavery um, was based. Um, and that initiative almost never happened. Um, but those interviews, hundreds of interviews, uh, for that we can thank a small team of African American researchers in the 1930s, uh, working behind the lines of segregation and Jim Crow restrictions. And they were, uh, the team in Virginia was led by a chemistry professor at Hampton named Roscoe Lewis. So I'll just briefly give uh, a little bit of background on um, that initiative, uh, who were the interviewers, how they found uh, some of the, the, the people they interviewed. Uh, and so first, what was the Federal Writers Project? Well, during the Great Depression, the Writers Project was a small part of the much bigger Works Progress Administration, or WPA, uh, an agency in uh, President Roosevelt's New Deal designed to kickstart the economy with job relief. Uh, the WPA uh, is mostly remembered today for infrastructure it created, it built uh, schools and hydroelectric dams and roads, national park facilities with uh, labor that had, with people that had been uh, idle when they lost jobs at the start of the depression. So the WPA started in 1935 and lasted nationally until the end of that decade. And then with state support, a uh, number of things lasted into the early 1940s. And the, the Writers Project was one of four small agencies within um, that that employed uh, arts workers in music, arts, uh, historical research, uh, and writing. And the Writers Project hired out of work journalists, authors, teachers, clerical workers uh, to give them a paycheck uh, and keep their skills active until the economy improved. 
So that uh, the Writers Project set up small offices in each state to oversee research and writing about history and life in that state. Um, and it had two main objectives. Uh, first, to research and publish a guidebook to the states, to each of the states. Uh, and these guidebooks were uh, together called the American Guides or, or later the, the WPA guidebooks. And those guidebooks are not just tour guides to tourist sites, but the, for example, the, the Virginia guidebook is a guide of driving routes across the state, highlighting all the towns you go through on the particular roads uh, that had uh, been built, uh, the, the automobile culture was just coming along, uh, along with essays on Virginia's history, economy, culture, landscape, and people. And so even small towns that you don't find in today's uh, travel guidebooks uh, appear in the, the WPA guidebook. Uh, and really their mandate uh, in the 1930s was to hold up a mirror to America, they said, from, from the ground up. And so um, it really was hired by, it was Virginians working um, on this research about their home state. Uh, the state office was in Richmond, um, but across the state, uh, hundreds of staff were gathering facts and local histories and visiting historic sites. Um, and uh, in Virginia, as elsewhere, most people on the Writers Project were white. Uh, local hiring usually reserved uh, jobs like that, uh, the jobs that were uh, kind of a, a benefit really for, for relief for white applicants. And so um, uh, there was proportionally uh, fewer uh, African-Americans hired by the right, Writers Project uh, across the country. And the WPA guide they produced often reflected uh, that bias, uh, leaving out often um, much of uh, other uh, communities' history, despite efforts from DC headquarters to, to get those histories in. Um, but uh, the project also had a mandate to research a range of ethnic histories and communities. And the national director of the Writers Project, uh, uh, um, uh, a journalist and a playwright named Henry Alsberg, he enlisted Howard University professor and poet uh, Sterling Brown uh, to lead a national effort uh, to document Black history. Um, and for that work in Virginia, Sterling Brown hired uh, a scholar named Roscoe Lewis, who had studied at Howard and who, had, who was, uh, he was a professor, uh, the professor at Hampton Institute I mentioned earlier. Uh, Hampton Institute, what now uh, Hampton University, uh, is an HBCU in the Tidewater area. And uh, Roscoe Lewis led the Virginia Negro Studies Unit uh, from that campus but he had uh, staff across the state. Uh, the unit staff consisted of about a dozen African-American writers, teachers, um, uh, former uh, nurses and others. Um, and uh, they, they, in 1936, they started work digging in local archives for black history um, evidence and, and looking in uh, headstones and cemeteries and public records for stories that were on the verge of, of being erased. Uh, some of this, even the cemeteries themselves had been uh, neglected by uh, municipalities and public institutions. Um, the records were, were often hard to come by. So um, that was a huge effort. Um, at the same time, um, they had the effort to try to find and interview a formerly enslaved people. So in the 1930s, thousands of formerly enslaved uh, people across the South and, uh, and elsewhere were uh, still alive. Um, most had been children at the time of the Civil War and, uh, and emancipation. Um, and in their 70s, sometimes older uh, in the 1930s, many had memories and stories to tell of that time. But, uh, but by the 1930s, slavery was really the last thing that many Americans wanted to hear about, black or white. Uh, white Southerners didn't want to he hear about reminders of uh, of that oppression and, and that institution. And even many black uh, younger people found the reminders humiliating uh, and didn't want to hear about it. So when a survivor, an older person told uh, her grandchildren or children about her youth in slavery, um, the young folks often got upset and it was not a, a conversation they wanted to come back to. So elders were understandably reticent to share those memories with strangers from the government coming around to, to ask you know about their experiences early in life. Um, but the interviewers on Lewis's team received training in building trust and they had a list of questions to ask that would 
get at uh, specific memories and and really get at the experience of what uh, these people's lives were like uh, and often getting past or, or navigating the trauma that often held those uh, memories in, in you know, contained. Um, so they often adapted those questions as they, they came to, uh, uh, to the particular interviewees. Other states, uh, in other states, uh, um, the effort to interview former enslaved people often uh, had relied on white interviewers. And that raised fears about their intentions and their bias, and often there were issues of trust. So the overall archive, uh, as historians recently have noted, there's uh, you know some questions about how uh, caveats for for using those the narratives to really get at that experience of uh, of slavery. Um, but in Virginia, uh, Lewis's interviewers um, contacted their sources and uh, built trust, and and the book they. They produced a book uh, It was intended to be the first of a series, uh, and theirs was titled The Negro in Virginia. And it came out in 1940, um, and it combined uh, selections from the interviews, uh, along with the document research, uh, really a history uh, from 1620 uh, to, uh, to, the you know, to 1940, when the book came out. And it was a critical success at the time. It was uh, a, um, a Book of the Month Club collection. The title hasn't aged well. Um, the Negro in Virginia now does not sound like a, a, a pioneering work, but the content of the book was, uh, was pioneering. It was pra praised by W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, other black scholars of the time, as well as and by later historians. Um, so it really is a, a work worth going back to. Um, you can find uh, copies actually of that book and of the Virginia WPA guidebook uh, uh, in uh, public libraries, including the Arlington Library. Um, and I'll, uh, we'll share uh, those titles and, uh, and links to, um, to the, those books in the library. Uh, I'll mention a couple of others along the way. You can also find PDFs of those two books, uh, the D Virginia WPA guidebook and, and the Negro in Virginia for free. Because they were produced with public funds, uh, they are not subject to copyright. Um, so online uh, PDFs are, are uh, uh, legal to exchange. Um, but the published versions, those published versions were toned down by editors and they, are not, they don't hold the, uh, the full record of uh, the interviews from the 1930s. And, and many of the Virginia interviews never made it into uh, the book or were shortened. Um, so going to find the original files and uh, the resources at the Library of Congress and also at the Library of Virginia in Richmond uh, can reveal a lot more. And I really recommend everyone uh, attending this uh, talk to, to check those out. Second uh, thing I'll, I'll talk about briefly is who conducted um, the, the interviews. The interviewers came from many backgrounds across Virginia. Uh, I'll mention just two here to give an uh, example. Um, one was a teacher in uh, Petersburg named Susie Bird. Uh, a, a historian at the Library of Virginia actually did more research on S Susie Bird. Uh, Greg Kimball uh, helped a lot, me and my research. Um, Bird didn't have a, an access to a, a typewriter, um, but uh, she was a, a, a teacher possessed of uh, research abilities and she wrote up her interviews longhand and she had uh, other forms of access that were really quite uh, remarkable. She discovered a trove of history just two blocks from her home in Petersburg. And there, a community of about 40 uh, formerly enslaved uh, people lived. Um, and she interviewed them um, both uh, individually um, and, uh, and uh, as a group. Um, and uh, so I'm sharing the uh, photo from the article online of, the, uh, of Roscoe Lewis. Uh, and uh, survivors in uh, in um, sorry about the ads in uh, in Petersburg and recording um, their uh, their uh, songs and as well as uh, at gatherings that they sometimes gathered uh, weekly um, and I'm sure that. Uh, um, the the uh, librarians from the Library of Congress will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, another interviewer in the Tidewater area was a young man named uh, 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 Claude Anderson. 
He was, a, he was born in Ohio where his grandparents settled after fleeing slavery. Uh, and in 1929, uh, as the economy crashed, Claude was enrolled as a student at Hampton. And so uh, he graduated, he took uh, odd jobs in the Newport area, got an offer of uh, a teaching job before he, that uh, offer went away because the school went under. Um, but he took a job uh, with the Writers Project and uh, under uh, Roscoe Lewis, uh, he went about um, researching and he wrote about his work with the, the Writers Project as being incredibly valuable. Um, they understood the, uh, the bridge to the past that they were creating and he described it this way and I quote, about half of my time has been spent traveling about the state to gather historical data. On these trips, I have interviewed and photographed ex-slaves, doctors, teachers, lawyers, city officials, and anyone whom I thought could give the needed data. This phase of the work gave me many memorable experiences. Once I slept in a roofless room. Another time I arrived to find the undertaker bringing out the body of the centurion I had planned to interview." Unquote. So these interviewers knew they were racing against time to gather these stories, these memories of people who had firsthand accounts of slavery of, uh, and, and it was a, a rare opportunity they recognized. They, a book came out last year uh, describing the experiences of both the project workers and the people they interviewed um, for an audience today. It's called To Walk About in Freedom, The Long Emancipation of Priscilla Joyner uh, by historian Carol Emberton. Um, Priscilla Joyner was one of those interviewees living in Southern Virginia uh, in the 30s and uh, who, who shared her life and its complexities. And, and uh, Emberton's book is really fascinating to, to get into that experience um, and, and the process of, of gathering it. Another book called Weevils in the Wheat, uh, edited by scholars at the University of Virginia in the 1970s, uh, has a full list of the Virginia slavery interviews and has much more than what was uh, what, what appeared in The Negro in Virginia. So um, with that, uh, we will, uh, I look forward to questions later at the end of the talk and I'll turn it over to the, uh, the experts from the Library of Congress uh, Dr. Sybil Moses and Angela McMillan for more about those resources uh, and tools. Thank you, David. I believe I will go first and I think Dr. Moses will be our last speaker. Hello and welcome to the, welcome to the presentation on narratives of enslaved Virginians. As previously, previously mentioned, my name is Angela McMillan. This presentation will highlight three online collections from the Library of Congress that contain interviews of former enslaved individuals. Today, I will briefly discuss how workers from the Federal Project, Writers Project began collecting slave narratives, as well as provide an overview of the three collections listed here. The Born in Slave Narratives, the Born in Slavery Slave Narratives from the Federal Writers Project collection contains more than 2,000 first person accounts of slavery and 500 black and white photographs of former slaves from 17 states. These narratives were collected in the 1930s as part of the Federal Writers, Writers Workers Project of the Workers Project Progress Administration, later renamed Work Projects Administration WPA. Initially, the Federal Writers Project plan did not include collecting the life stories of former enslaved individuals. Interviews with former enslaved individuals began after the outset of the Federal Writers Project and were included among the activities of several Southern writer projects. Pictured here is the collection homepage, which includes the title of the collection, information about the collection, a link to collection items, a link to articles and essays and featured content. Also, you can find links to related resources, rights and access information and exports, expert sources. The articles and essay page provides additional information on various topics related to the collection, such as an introduction to the WPA slave narratives, voices and faces from the collection, a note on the language of the narratives and a guide to using the collection. The essay on the importance of the slave narrative collection explains how the study of the slave narratives as well as data from the slave sources has been an important element in the search of scholarship. The slave narrative collection has not only provided a wealth of previously unexploited data on the institution of slavery, 
but it has also responded to interests of proponents of the new social history for data that will reflect the perspectives of the voiceless masses on seldom left written evidence from which to write their history. John A. Lomax, folklorist, was tasked with directing the project for gathering narratives of former enslaved individuals and insisted that all narratives be recorded verbatim and not censored. He stated the Federal Writers Project is not interested in taking sides. The slave, native, slave, the slave narrative collection consists of narrative text deri derived from oral interviews. The narratives usually involve some attempt by the interviewers to reproduce and writing the spoken language of the people they interviewed in accordance with instructions from the project's headquarters, the National Office of Federal Writers Projects in Washington, DC. The interviewers were not writers, not professionals trained in fanatic transcription of speech and the instructions they received were not always clear. And at your leisure, I do encourage you to go back and read some of these essays because do go, they do go more into how um, they started gathering the collections, the language, um, and some of the difficulties they encountered interviewing. Here you can find a list of the uh, race um, of the interviewers, which were supplied by Norman R. Yelton. Um, which he started compiling for the introduction of the WPA slave narratives for the release of the online collection. And this particular list includes two African-American interviewers from Virginia. The narrative ex excerpts presented here are a small sample of the wealth of stories available in this online collection. Some narratives contain startling descriptions of cruelty while others convey an almost nostalgic view of plantation life. These narratives provide an invaluable first person account of slavery and the individuals it affected. I will read a small portion of the narrative of John W. Fields, age 89. And most of us colored folks was the great desire to be able to read and write. We took advantage of every opportunity to educate ourselves. The greater part of the plantation owners were very harsh if we were caught trying to learn or write. It was the law that if a white man was caught trying to educate a Negro slave, he was liable to prosecution in telling a fine of $50 and a jail sentence. We were never allowed to go to town and it was not until after I ran away that I knew that they sold anything but slaves, tobacco and whiskey. Our ignor ignorance was the greatest hold the South had on us. We knew we could run away, but what then? An offender guilty of this crime was subjected to very harsh punishment. Again, I do encourage you to go back and um, read some of these narratives. This page is an item record for the Virginia slave narratives. The item record tells you information about the item, which includes the title, headings, notes, rights and access information, citation information, as well as other details. This slide is a table of contents for the Virginia narratives, and it includes 50 narratives within a total of 60 pages. This is an example of an interview of Mrs. Della Harris conducted by Susie Bird on February 5th, 1937. And I'm just gonna read a small sample of it. I don't know just how old I is. Mama sent me to private school with white children for one week. I was 15 years old at the time of Lee's surrender. I belonged to Peter or Billy Buck Turnbull of Warrington, North Carolina. Put this down. My mother and family all belonged to Peter Buck as his slaves. We didn't work until after the war. Then we became, then we came to Petersburg. I went to dancing school with the white folks and can dance any kind of dance sets. My father was a musician. He belonged to John Orton in Warrington, North Carolina. In them days, you had to take your master and mistress name. In slavery time, when a slave married, he had to ask his master or mistress. We never went to church. We used to hear the bells ringing loud, baby. Yes, clear and strong. No, never seen Sunday school. And the first time I went in, and the first time I went in a church, I looked all around, baby, and I thought I was in heaven. I do encourage you to revisit this narrative as well as the, the others when you have the time. 
The recordings of former slaves and the voices remembering slavery, free people tell their stories, took place between 1932 and 1975 in nine states. 22 interviewees discussed how they felt about slavery, slaveholders, coercion of slaves, their families, and freedom. Several individuals sing songs, many of which were learned during the time of their enslavement. It is important to note that all of the interviewees spoke 60 or more years after the end of their enslavement, and it's their full lives that are reflected in these recordings. Unfortunately, not all of the recordings are clearly audible. Although the original tapes and discs are generally in good condition, background noise and poorly positioned microphones make it extremely difficult to follow many of the interviews. And this is just the home page again for this particular collection. This page includes seven photographs of former enslaved individuals from this particular audio collection. You can look at their faces as you listen to them talk about their lives, describing what it was like being enslaved and becoming free. Featured here is Fountain Hughes, who was interviewed by the Townsend Merlin Jeffersonian in 1952, when he was 101. Also, Charlie Smith, who lived to be 137, had a book and numerous newspapers and magazine articles written about him. This page provides photographs and brief biographies of some of the interviewers from this particular collection. Sociologist and editor Charles S. Johnson was born in Bristol, Virginia, and was a classical and was given classical education by his father, Reverend Charles Henry Johnson, a Baptist minister who had been taught to read English, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew by his former slave master. In 1916, the younger Johnson earned a BA from Virginia Uni Union University in Richmond. One of his most important books is Shadow of the Plantation, published in 1934, a study of the collapse of Southern Cotton, Tennessee, in which he demonstrated that racial discrimination was compounded by the economic exploitation that existed in the South during the Great Depression. Johnson argued that sharecropping created an ongoing economic basis for racial discrimination and dis demonstrated how powerful agrarian and industrial interests shape the human relations of race and racism. And again, here's an item record for the interview with Sarah Ashton Brooks. And you have the option from this particular page of listening to the interview, um, or you can download and read the transcript. And we will now listen to a portion of the interview and you can try to read it from this first page that's on the screen. Sarah, um, Sarah uh, my mother is, um, is 93 years old, the 2nd of um, October. She lives with me. She's a mother of 13 children, five, five minutes. Um, I'm sure she lives with me. Oh, she has three, um, no, four boys. Yeah, Nelson is one, Tom, Tom, Douglas, and uh, Richard. Oh, yeah, she has a two grandchildren, 25 grandchildren. But Kim, great grandchildren. So again, I do encourage you um, when you have the time to go back and listen to some of the audio recordings. As previously mentioned, a lot of them are not clear and there's a lot of background noise, but they did the best that they could during the time. This collection of life histories consisted of approximately 2,900 documents compiled and transcribed by more than 300 writers from 24 states working on the folklore project of the Federal Writers Project, a New Deal job program that was part of the US Works Progress. The documents chronicle vivid life stories of Americans who lived at the turn of the century and include tales of meeting Billy the Kid, surviving the 1871 Chicago fire, 
pioneer journeys out West and grueling factory work in the immigrant experience. This particular collection contains um, at least 39 items on slavery. And here is um, the narrative for the remnants of a Negro, Negro preacher, Alonzo Power from 8th Inch, Georgia. And I'm just gonna read um, a few of the lines from there. Well, I was born in Madison County, six miles from Danielsville about 80 years ago in 1859. I was a slave miss, but a happy one. My young mistress and master's names were Nancy and John Lester. My father's master's name was Jimmy Nunn. He lived on Danielsville Road. My father would have to get a pass from Mr. Jimmy to come see my mother. You see, they were on different plantations. He got to come to see my mother twice a week. If he slipped out without the pass, the patrollers got him I got after him. And if he and he and if he would run out, run after, and if he would run them and got back to his master, he was safe. But if he didn't, he got a whipping. 25 licks was what he would get. So again, as with the other narratives, I do encourage you to go back and read them and listen to them when you have the time. And this is a, a list of selective resources on slavery that will provide you with additional information on the topic. And I would like to thank you for taking the time this afternoon to listen to this portion of the presentation. If you have any questions, you can contact us using our Ask a Librarian form. So now we're going to turn it over to Dr. Sybil Moses. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sybil Moses and a professional librarian and archivist. Um, thank you again for extending it, the invitation for us to meet with you today in order to highlight selected information about the narratives of African-Americans who were, were enslaved as represented in the Library of Congress's collections. Uh, this component of the presentation focuses on those narratives uh, that were specific to Virginia. Those were Virginians or people were, who were enslaved in Virginia who actually wrote and published their own stories. Uh, a few of these works were not widely circulated. In fact, they remained in the archives and other repositories uh, practically unknown. And so uh, a number of scholars went and, and actually published those narratives along with commentary, but the narratives as they were originally uh, wrote uh, were included in these volumes. And so in that case, uh, I'll be showing you a few of the uh, edited volumes, but they contain the narrative as written by themselves. Um, let's see, to set the stage, I would like to share two thoughts that serve as the basis of my approach to African-American history, and then the framework for this aspect of the presentation. The first is something I always begin with, and that is, in my field, uh, we say that a text that is undiscoverable for all practical purposes does not exist. Okay, a text that is not discoverable for all practical purposes does not exist. And so in the case of published, even unpublished works, if we cannot discover these, uh, they don't exist. And that pertains to these narratives as well as any other uh, work that someone has, has created. Um, and that is the reason why I will um, include that in, uh, in the approach by showing you some of the tools I use to discover these narratives by those who were formerly enslaved in Virginia. So that's one component. Um, also, I use this approach when I work with African-American uh, women's organizations, and I take it a bit beyond that uh, because I tell them that if they don't write their his histories, capture the voices of, of their elders in these organizations, uh, for all practical purposes, it will they, the organization doesn't exist if people cannot find information about it. Who is there to tell that story? And Manning Mar Marable, um, the late professor of political science, social history, public policy, 
made an observation and that was a culture without a deep reservoir drawing upon collective memory ceases to exist. And that's the same thought, a culture without a deep reservoir drawing upon collective memory ceases to exist. And so here you see the importance of these narratives by the formerly enslaved because it has allowed that aspect of African-American culture to exist. Um, we are able to draw back and learn from those experiences, re-examine and reimagine uh, what happened and use it for uh, the greater good. So Manning all further asserted that the history of slavery and its legacy based on these memories and accounts are more accurate in documenting the true indignity of slavery than the written reflection of former owners. Some people may take issue with that, but um, there is much truth to the fact that, that these collective memories and accounts are more accurate in documenting the true indignity uh, of slavery. And as you get to know some of these uh, narratives, you'll see that documentation. This presentation is uh, approached as follows. I'll briefly mention selected tools that I used uh, to identify published narratives of enslaved Virginians, and also a tool that can be used to um, uh, identify subject headings, Library of Congress uh, subject headings, and some of those subject headings. Also, there is a subject guide to the Federal's Writers Project uh, that is a useful guide, and I use that as well. Um, and Angela and I compared what was digitized versus what we found there. Um, so we'll go through that rather quickly. Then I'll mention uh, selected manuscript collections, just two, uh, documenting the lives of African-Americans formerly enslaved in the state of Virginia. And the meat will be to unveil or uncover or put out there selected published narratives by African-Americans formerly enslaved. And then at the end, we have a list of additional resources and um, Ms. Budolf will share that list with you. Okay, when one is trying to figure out how do we discover these narratives of enslaved people uh, who had an experience in Virginia, where do you even begin? Well, the first thing you wanna do is look for, to see if a bibliography or a guide exists. Um, but in addition to doing that, you also want to see what subject headings the Library of Congress has assigned to these narratives or to collections of these narratives. Uh, you want to also look for other um, uh, subjects that relate to uh, uh, the life of the enslaved in Virginia. Now, one broad subject heading would be African-Americans in Virginia, history dash the 17th century, okay? Or slavery in Virginia, history 17th century, all right? Then you can get down to the actual uh, genre, uh, look for subject headings, slaves in Virginia, dash interviews, uh, that's a general, you know, overall state. And you sometimes the cataloger will assign that to when they cannot identify the specific county or city or place where a person was enslaved. So a lot of your general uh, uh, narratives uh, 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 by enslaved people in Virginia would come under that category. Then when they can identify where someone was, they will specify that. And the beginning of the subject heading would be slaves, Virginia, King, George County, or Pit Pittsylvania County, or Richmond, et cetera. So these are just examples. This is not exhaustive. These are examples of subject headings and how one might approach identifying or what I call discovering some of what exists uh, in terms of this subject we're uh, discussing today. Another approach would be freed men uh, in Virginia in counties and their biographies. Sometimes you'll pick up a narrative there and sometimes biography will not include uh, 
will not pertain to a, a bio, an autobiography, but a biography written by somebody else. But what I have found is that the narratives, the autobiographies do have that subdivision. Also, we want to look for fugitive slaves as well. Fugitive slaves in history, uh, there are some source guides to that literature. Uh, there are registers, you know, list of, of fugitive slaves. Uh, one was produced by a um, penal or jail and they listed um, enslaved people there. So these are useful sources. And then just general, the subject heading, Fugitive Slaves, Virginia Biography. This is what we call controlled vocabulary, because if you go, you have no idea of a person's name, you have no idea of a title. So you need to figure out what controlled, what vocabulary will be used to try to discover or identify that information. So that's just a sample. And at least now you know what to ask for or what to kind of begin thinking about if you're interested in pursuing this topic further. Then there are also uh, sources that I used to um, begin trying to get a handle on this. And one was uh, Brignano. This is a, a bibliography of Black Americans in autobiography. So, um, this you can go, but here again, you have to look to see where something is published. You need to look at the dates. You need to indicate because there's nothing, unless it's in the title, that will tell you it's Virginia. So that's rough. Another one that will be on your reading list is Slave Testimony by uh, John Blassingame. And that's a compilation of all sorts of testimonies, wills, um, narratives, etc. And in the back, there's a subject in the index, there's one for, G for Virginia, and it's rather extensive. And so I took that book, it's about almost 800 pages, and I went through that to begin identifying um, uh, narratives by enslaved people in Virginia. So these are just a few examples. I put Booker T. Washington here because he's kind of close to my heart. As a child, we used to drive south and went to Tuskegee often to visit uh, the families of friends of my father when he was in the, what did they call it? The uh, US Army Air Flying School at Tuskegee. That's what they now call Tuskegee Airmen. But at that time it was called the Army Air Flying School. And he would always take us to this uh, statue of Booker T. Washington lifting the veil of ignorance off and he would add off of the enslaved, okay, slaves. But it's a famous statue on the campus of Tuskegee, formerly Tuskegee Institute, which uh, Booker T. Washington was president. And um, it's, 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 it's part of his philosophy of education and many of the philosophy of many others as well. So I include that because Booker T. Washington was enslaved in Virginia and um, on your list will be uh, his two biographies. Most people only know up from slavery, but there's also another biography by Booker T. Washington. Um, now, manuscripts, selected Library of Congress manuscript collections of African-Americans formerly enslaved. There are two that I will highlight. One is Booker T. Washington's papers, and this is a fascinating collection, and you see how how large it is. It's over a thousand containers. There are over 375,000 items in there and it occupies more than 400 uh, linear feet. Uh, then we also have the papers of, uh, in fact, it's, it's actually a diary of um, John Washington uh, who was enslaved in Virginia and it's his diary. And so that's available and it's available on microfilm. So these are just two examples of people formerly enslaved in Virginia in our manuscript collection. It is not exhaustive at all. Um, then now getting down to the nitty gritty, uh, the selected published narratives of African-Americans formerly uh, enslaved in Virginia, but written by themselves. Quite often you see written by themselves in the, uh, uh, at the end of the title, 
because they want to make sure that um, you know they wrote this as opposed to dictating uh, their story to someone else who then wrote or rewrote or redesigned uh, their story. And so some of the earliest uh, narratives are William Grimes from Virginia. And that's all he says is that I'm, you know, I'm from Virginia. Uh, Austin Stewart, who was from Prince William County. Elizabeth Keckley, whom many of us know, also wrote her autobiography. Uh, Peter Randolph, and then Booker T. Washington. These are just a few. All right, here's Elizabeth Keckley. And the reason her autobiography is so important is that it helps us understand the life and experiences of enslaved women in Virginia. You know, she was a dressmaker and personal confidant of Mary Todd Lincoln. Um, she got a lot of slack on her autobiography uh, behind the scenes or 30 years a slave and four years in the White House because she revealed quite a bit of information. So that, that's a fascinating uh, narrative and quite popular. Another is William uh, Grimes. And sources indicate that William Grimes is the author of the first fugitive slave narrative in American history, uh, published in 1825. Library of Congress has a copy of that. And you'll see his dates are 1784 to 1865. Um, Life of William Grimes, the Runaway Slave. And that has an interesting story because um, his great, great, great granddaughter uh, was the one who got a scholar, a literary scholar to um, bring together the two. He has two biographies. Um, and this scholar brought, brought together these items and then did a commentary. He, uh, William Grimes didn't include any dates. So the scholar, not as part of Grimes's text, but as a part of the, um, the preface, uh, he, they did the editor, literary editing you know, at the beginning and compared it to other narratives, et cetera. So it put it in historical context, but the actual um, two narratives are included verbatim and the great, great, great granddaughter arranged for a repository to um, lend these to uh, the scholars so that they could do that. Then there's uh, Henry Watson. Okay, and I wanted to read from Henry Watson because it talks about the naming, but I don't know if we have time. If we have time later on, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, narrative of Henry Watson, a fugitive slave. This is the third edition. Okay, he kept, he needed money and he just kept on uh, publishing and publishing, but his, it's a short narrative and very much worth, worth your time because it tells about his life and how he escaped and went to Boston. And then there's uh, Peter Randolph. Peter Randolph was a former slave again who escaped, all right? And there are two of his uh, autobiographies contained in this work. Here's an example of a work that was edited. Um, the, the narratives are not edited. They're, they're verbatim, sketches of slave life and from slave cabin to the pulpit. He was a minister. Um, he went to Canada. He was also president of one of the, they had a colony up there in West Canada. And he was also... Uh, that, but he was, he became an abolitionist and um, was quite popular. So these are just a few. And then uh, Austin Stewart. No, this is, no, Austin Stewart is the person who went to Canada. Okay, Wilberforce Colony in London, West Canada, Canada West. A number of uh, enslaved persons went to Canada West. There's a woman I'm working on, um, by the name of Agnes Moody, who uh, escaped and went to Canada and uh, later settled in um, Chicago and became the grand worthy matron for the Order of the Eastern Star of Prince Hall Masons in the state of Illinois. Uh, quite a um, well-known orator and she had other, other 
uh, well-known uh, achievements as well. But she went to West Canada as well. Okay, so what are some of the additional uh, resources or some of the useful resources that one may have to supplement or provide historical context for um, learning about African-Americans in Virginia, enslaved in Virginia. There's a work uh, that includes advertisements for runaway slaves in Virginia from 1801 to 1820. There's also another uh, work on um, the experience of colonial Virginia and essays on the arrival and legacy of slavery. And then we have a volume of slave trade statistics, uh, the, the enslaved people uh, arriving in Virginia. And that's a very interesting and old work as well. Um, here are a few others, Weevils in the Wheat, uh, Slave Testimony. This is the one by Blassingame. I told you that it's just so useful for identifying these narratives. And I've had a conversation with some of my colleagues about, you know, where is the control over all of these narratives by enslaved people? And, you know, we haven't found a guide yet uh, that includes all of them. You know, it's, it's rough, but uh, someone was working on narratives of people who escaped and went to the West. Uh, so there are a couple of volumes there. But it's it's just it's just fascinating. This is just for Virginia, and this is not all that I found in Virginia. There's a list that I've put together of of some of those, um, but it's just fascinating. And these were not in the ones that you have on your list were not included in the um, WPA narratives. Okay, um, it's it's um, well. They, they were published by themselves and, and it's the voices of the people and that has not been altered at all. Okay, um, thanks to Angela. Um, you can learn more about slavery, these resources from a number of the sites that we have. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming. I hope we've shared uh, information that might be new to you um, uh, I have a kind of a side that I'd like to end with, and that is, uh, why are these narratives so very important? And there are a number of perspectives, and the person that I often read is Manning Marable, and he observed that the central question in the construction of U.S. social history is, and it's this, what makes the African-American people so different from most other Americans in their political and social attitudes, behaviors, and civic practices? He concluded that the collective experience of pain and hardship, suffering and sacrifice has given African-Americans a unique perspective from which our consciousness has been forged. And that's from a text, uh, Living Black History, that he published before he uh, passed away. And uh, in, in, it was published in 2006. And so that's, that's another view on why these collective memories of the narratives as represented in the narratives of these enslaved people um, in Virginia is so very important. Okay, and um, thank you very much. And I hope I haven't gone over my time. Thank you so much, Dr. Moses. We really appreciate your sharing that with us. Um, if you wouldn't mind maybe to, uh, to stop share, that would be fabulous, um, wonderful. Um, I, I wanna thank our presenters. Um, this has been amazing and fascinating. I thank you so, so much for taking time out from what I know are very, very busy schedules to speak with us and enlighten us about this. Uh, I uh, really did not know about it. And I thank uh, David Taylor for writing the article in the Washington Post and for illuminating for us today 
uh, this information to, to kind of visualize what the interviewers were like and the people who were interviewed, I think was, was fascinating. I can't imagine sitting down with somebody who used to be somebody's property to try to preserve their story. But I am so glad that the federal government through the New Deal did realize how critically important it was to preserve these stories for history uh, and, and that we have it and that we have uh, stored it uh, at the Library of Congress is just amazing. And we have these reference specialists who can um, tap these treasures for us to help us find these voices. Um, for me to actually hear an audio recording of a voice of somebody who had been born into slavery is just amazing. And I'm grateful for that opportunity to have heard it and to see and hear the stories uh, in people's own words is, is just amazing. And as you can see from this program, there's a tremendous wealth of resources available to uh, glean more information about these narratives. Uh, they're available at the Library of Congress and they're available um, in books, uh, some of which we have at the Arlington Library. Um, I will be sending everyone uh, um, a, a list and actually Bridget Wisdom, our um, adult services librarian will be sending an email with the very lengthy um, supplemental resource list, uh, your reading list uh, following the um, program. Uh, there are there are books, uh, there are articles, there's all kinds of resources um, that our presenters would like to share with you so you can get more information about it. Um, we have gone over time, but I do want to give people an opportunity to ask questions if they have them. Um, I don't think there were any in the chat, but if you would like to just, um, uh, you can put them in the chat or unmute yourself uh, and ask your question. We just have time for just a few, um, but um, please go ahead. Sheila, I'll, right. <laughs> I'll start if, if uh, possible. Uh, okay. And then somebody else had a question as well, but please lead us off. Okay. Um, I've uh, done some preliminary research on the, the, uh, the slave owners in southwestern um, Virginia. And, and I guess I'm interested in whether the, uh, the, the presenters uh, have any insight into uh, working in, in those southwestern counties like Washington County and Abingdon, uh, Wythe County and Withville in this area? Because I haven't found very much information uh, and I'm wondering if they have any thoughts on that. I guess I can say briefly uh, that I think one resource or two resources would be those uh, books, the WPA Guide to Virginia and the Negro in Virginia, which both um, by, uh, by county uh, and by region of the state look at the, you know, the history. Uh, so I think those who would find some, uh, some pointers there as far as where, where to look for further, uh, further accounts, but um, those are both geographically wide and they're not just looking at uh, Tidewater and, and Richmond and Petersburg, but really across the state. Okay, thank you. Also, okay. um, we have a local history uh, section and Angela showed you the Ask a Librarian service. And that's a useful resource for writing into us and um, seeking guidance on various possibilities of where you can go. Uh, and one is, all, they always include the local histo historical societies as, as a source to consult as well. Thank you for that. Um, we have time for one more question and then I would like to um, give Bridget Wisdom an opportunity to tell us a little bit more about where to find some of these resources at Arlington Public Library, but, First, one more question. Somebody else. I just had. A, a, hi, it's Melissa. Hi. I just had one. I just had a, a statement. Can you hear me, Sheila? 
Okay, yes, I just want you. to thank the three people for what for collecting these narratives because we live in a time of history, and I'm in my late sixties, um, where we live in a country that's trying to erase Black history. And I feel very grateful today that there are collections that are being housed throughout the United States in very safe places. So when America returns to a place where they can face their past, face their future, and have equal justice, that these materials will be available. And I just want, I'm just saying, want to tell them how grateful I am that they have pursued this and have collected this. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for that, Melissa. Um, Bridget, would you like to uh, let people know where they can find these resources? Hi, yeah, thank you, Sheila. The first three titles that in the list that David had dropped and several were mentioned also um, by Dr. Moses and Angela are in our Center for Local History. The, bi the biography, I have it actually right here at my desk, is available and can be checked out here at Central Library, or we can send it to you at a branch. I would also like to encourage people to check out our Center for Local History for your initial search. Of course, we can't offer everything the Library of Congress has, but um, we are here, we're local, and it's a good place to start. If I can, I would like to also give a shout out to, we are in the winter, winter reading, which starts January 1st through March 1st. So if you haven't begun that, please join us. And I'm gonna drop a link in the chat for some more of our programs this month at throughout our library system for in celebration of Black History Month. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you everyone for this fantastic program. Thank you so much, Bridget. Thank you for all you do. You're wonderful. Sheila? Thank you everybody for joining. Yes, yes, sorry. I, I have one historical fact that I think needs to be included in this Fabulous. discussion. And yes. that is um, those narratives were collected prior to the federal government. And as early as the 1920s, uh, a group of African-American intellectuals at Fisk University, Kentucky State University, and Southern University started collecting uh, the narratives because they realized that that generation of people who had, had survived uh, enslavement were dying off fast. And so they wanted to capture those voices. And so they started at that point. And some of them, some of those narratives are included in uh, Ray Wick's, uh, I think it's volume 17 or 18, uh, the items from Fisk University. Another thing is be on the lookout because a friend of mine who teaches at a community college in Virginia, one Thanksgiving brought out a pillowcase full of papers for me to, to show me. And in that pillowcase uh, were recorded index cards and other papers from the slave, they were recordings of the slave narratives. This, this was, and they were the work of Ophelia, what was Ophelia's last name? Settle Egypt, who was one of the um, interviewers. And it was her niece, the, her, uh, her, the aunt had died and they were cleaning out her house. And she brought this to this friend of mine who's a professor and said, oh, I know you'll know what to do with it. So these materials are still out there. The original materials are still out there in the homes of some people. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Yeah. And what a monumental task to collect it all and then to organize it in a way that other people yes. can find it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Monumental. This has been fascinating, absolutely phenomenal. Thank you to the three of you for, for giving us this wonderful talk and, and enriching our lives with these stories. We really are very, very grateful to you. Thank you to all of our participants for joining us. We appreciate it, hope you enjoyed it. Um, all kinds of great, uh, great mentions in the chat. Um, Thank you to all of our uh, librarians, uh, Arlington librarians and Library of Congress librarians for all that you do to preserve history, basically to preserve history. That's what we need to do. And, and uh, these stories have been phenomenal. Um, and, and, and thank you, David Taylor, for, for being such a wonderful writer and bringing this story to light. 
uh, with your writing. It's fabulous. Thank you all. We appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Uh, everybody be well and take care. <laughs>